book that we are launching at this very moment is truly wonderful. It's been the labor of love of Professor David Latchman. And to him, on all of our behalf, I offer our praise. What an incredible contribution his work is to our celebrations. And now that we reflect on our wonderful past, we can all the more appreciate what we are in the present time. And as a result, we recognize that Baruch Hashem, we have a great future ahead of us. I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to participate in the launch of a special book marking the 150th anniversary of the United Synagogue. The number 150 features only once in our tradition. Its significance is that that's the number of chapters in the book of Psalms. Psalms, of course, is Tehillim, which literally means words of praise. So therefore, in marking this special anniversary, let's offer our Tehillim, our words of praise. We express our praise for those who created the United Synagogue in 1870. We offer words of praise to all the wonderful rabbis and rabbitsons, community leaders, and everyone who has played a role, countless individuals, wonderful families, throughout these years to build, maintain our communities and to enable us to flourish and to succeed in the spectacular way that we've been able to. Above all, on this auspicious occasion, we offer our words of praise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to thank the Almighty for the assistance He has given us over the past 150 years. And we pray that He will continue to bless us, the United Synagogue, this most wonderful and glorious organization, that we shall now go Mechayel El Chayel from strength to added strength in the future. So thank you, Chief Rabbi. Hi, I'm Miriam Marson, project manager for the 150th anniversary of the United Synagogue, and I'm also the Judaic coordinator there. And I'm delighted to be here today with Professor David Latchman, CBE, who's a renowned British geneticist and university leader. He is also vice chancellor of Birkbeck University of London and professor of genetics at Birkbeck and University College London. He is the chair of the Morris World Charitable Foundation too. And David, we're here today to talk about your marvelous new book, The US 150 Years of Service, illustrated by orders of service and key artifacts from your collection. And your book outlines the history in such a unique way. You use orders of service, demonstrating how the United Synagogue communities responded to key events of the day, such as religious events, national events, wars, jubilees, and you highlight their unique position in British society. And then you bring the stories to life and the histories to life with key artifacts from your very unique collection. And the book is very visual with stunning photographs. Um, and actually they bring a new dimension to telling the stories and bringing the stories to life. So David, I just want to start off by asking you, how did you choose the items for the book when you have such a large collection? Yes, it was not easy. I'm, I have a large collection of orders of service. And so I went through that collection, picking out things that were connected with the United Synagogue and its constituents' shuls. Um, and that left me with um, around 300 or so. So I had to slim it down a bit more. Um, and so then I sort of tried to develop themes like royalty, the founding shuls, one shul that was founded subsequently in the north of London, the south of London, the west of London, the east of London. Um, and that eventually got it down to 150. And then I started to think what artifacts I had in my collection that went with those orders of service and complemented them. So that's, that's where we got to it. Yes. So as you said, you broke the book down into various categories, such as royalty and chief rabbis. And um, in your religious life section, you really bring context to the founding of the United Synagogue with the treaty that you've got from 18, was it 1834? And 1834, yes. You have to remember that the United Synagogue, the, the founders of the United Synagogue, the, the, the shuls basically broke away from the great synagogue. So there was a huge dispute in the early 18th century that led to the formation of the Hamburg shul by a breakaway from the great, and another one that led to the formation of the new synagogue. So these three old shuls had basically arisen from a huge couple of machloikas. And so eventually they started sort of reluctantly working together 
since they were all within a few hundred yards of each other. Um, and so they produced a treaty in the 1830s, which allowed them to cooperate together. And in fact, I'll just read you, um, this is the original thing, which I hope you can see on the screen, um, and signed by the representatives. And it says, um, and you can see one of their problems, that the burial of Orchim, or strangers, shall be apportioned amongst the three synagogues in the following manner. The great synagogue shall bury one half, the Hambra synagogue one quarter, and the new synagogue one quarter. So they started to cooperate together in terms of things, the expenses of burying poor people who died without family um, and so on. So there were obviously lots of communal issues and they started trying to work together in probably the first third of the 19th century. Yes, and of course that led on to, in 1870, the Act of Parliament, and you've got the picture of the Act yes. of Parliament, and the United Synagogue was the only is the only Jewish organization to be founded by an act of parliament. Yes, so, and what happened then was that as Jews moved progressively to the west of London, a couple of other shuls were opened, Bayswater and the Central, but they were under the aegis of the three founding synagogues, so they weren't really independent. And then, in 1870, the three original ones and these two branches formed the United Synagogue. And you mentioned, Miriam, it's the only sort of act of parliament. It's actually a very short act. It's like half a half a page um, and basically it says whereas the charity commissioners for England and Wales have reported they have provisionally approved the scheme for the Jewish United Synagogues be it enacted by the Queen's most excellent majesty that the said scheme shall be confirmed and take effect. There is about a 30 page commentary after that but the act itself is very very short and that's where the United Synagogue gains its legitimacy from. Yeah very interesting and and in the, in the same chapter, you talk about the early geographic changes and U.S. membership growth. And I think you specifically talk about East London Synagogue because it was, was the first purpose-built synagogue? Yes. So after the five synagogues have founded the United Synagogue, one should say the founder of the United Synagogue, who never actually took the presidency himself, was somebody called Lionel Louis Cohen. Um, I have a Vanity Fair caricature of him. He was the MP for Paddington. And he basically founded the United Synagogue and he had a tremendous interest in East London um, and in developing a United Synagogue in East London, where at the time there were obviously mainly small shtibels and, and hebras. And so he basically got the United Synagogue to support um, East London Synagogue. And I have here, I hope we can go on the screen, but I have here, this is the trowel. Oh, silver okay. trowel that was given to him um, and normally these things on the, when he laid the foundation stone in 1879 I think and normally these things have a sort of thing saying recording whatever that so and so laid the foundation stone here there's a whole sort of um, panegyric engraved onto the silver of how Lionel Louis Cohen what he did for our community in East London and how he helped us found the shul um, and so on. So he was uh, really the founder of the United Synagogue and the founder of East London. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and then you have a chapter where you talk about royalty. And I've got to tell you, that's just wonderful because it's full of really interesting insights and images and paraphernalia and all sorts of things. And it, it shows the relationship between the United Synagogue and royalty in a way I've not actually seen it before. You know, you've got grouse shooting, photos of Queen Elizabeth and all sorts of images. Um, and, but the, the, fact, the, the monarchy at the time was Queen Victoria in 1870. Yes. I'm amazed to hear about eight attempted assassinations. Yes, I hadn't, I hadn't realised that Queen Victoria was subject to eight assassination attempts until um, a few years ago, I acquired various letters which were sent to Sir Moses Montefiore, um, I think in 1882, saying that these rabbis in Israel had, as agreed, said prayers of thanksgiving for Queen Victoria surviving her eighth assassination wow. attempt, in which somebody shot at her as her carriage was leaving Windsor Station when she'd arrived on the Windsor um, Station from London. Um, and so he was actually thrown to the ground, the assassin, by Eton College boys who were standing at the side of the road cheering um, the Queen on. Um, and so the, these rabbis said prayers of thanksgiving. And I think you'll see hopefully on the screen those prayers together with the front page of an illustrated newspaper at the time, which shows the sort of drawing of the assassination um, attempt on Queen Victoria. 
Yes, very dramatic image from, is it the Illustrated London News yes. where someone's yes. attempting it? And then you have the letters as well, which are really beautiful to look at. Yes. And yeah, it's really nice. And then of course you, you, you mentioned that Queen Elizabeth and the ro royalty was for a hundred years of... Well, I think Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth together account for almost a hundred years of the 150 years of the United Synagogue. Yeah. So from 1870 to 1901, um, and then the present Queen. Um, and obviously there've been commemorations of Queen Victoria's Jubilee and Diamond Jubilee, the Queen's Jubilee and Diamond Jubilee. Um, and interestingly, going back to the Queen Victoria, you have an order of service, which I've hopefully comes on the screen, um, which look has um, not only a choir, um, but also an organ being played in the Great Synagogue, um, which I don't think was played on the equivalent um, occasion for Queen Elizabeth II. Um, but then for her Jubilee, um, the Duke of Gloucester, her cousin, um, came to the service, and the service had lots of children from different uh, United Synagogue shuls giving sort of reciting um, songs and poems about Queen Elizabeth's reign. So I think we see there the change in the transition from a very, very formal service with an organ and a choir and so on into still a formal service, but one in which the children of the community played a key part in the, uh, the jubilee of the Queen, her present, the present Queen. Sorry, and just to ask, these orders of service would have been published centrally and issued to communities, or were they published by communities, individuals? Well, you find very different things, actually. I mean, what you find, sometimes they issued a sort of general order of service, and then there would be a sort of wrapper around it. So, for example, I mean, I've got it here, the, the one Queen Victoria's Jubilee in the Great Synagogue, um, as you can see, but this wrapper is a wrapper that was specifically for the Great Synagogue. And then inside was obviously what was issued to all the communities and doesn't actually say Great Synagogue on it. Um, and then sometimes they issued ones, a, a different show would print one that said Great Synagogue on it and others would print their own things. Oh. So there's all different, uh, different variations. And often when you think you have all of them, you suddenly discover that some other shul that you didn't know about also held a service and it's got a, a commemoration as well. Yes, that's nice to keep collecting them, I suppose. Yes, um, well, it's a sort of treadmill now. So now I keep <laughs> you know, buying whatever comes along. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's a, there's a chapter on um, war and persecution. And, you know, in World War I, you mentioned there was approximately 50,000 Jewish servicemen. And you've got medals. And um, from Yes. I mean, there's a, in fact, there's a whole book, which is called British Jewry's Book of Honour, that was produced in the 1920s, which lists, supposedly, every single Jewish serviceman um, who served in the First World War. Um, and so many of them did win medals. I mean, I think hopefully can go on the screen, but these are, these are the medals of somebody called Lieutenant Wilfred Rosen. Um, and the one at this end is the most important one that I'm pointing to, and that is the Military Cross, which is the second highest decoration that you can get after the Victoria Cross. And he won this in the Palestine um, campaign when they eventually took Jerusalem. Um, and it's the citation says, Second Lieutenant Wilfred Rosen, London Regiment, for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty during an attack on a village. He was the first to enter the village, leading the firing line of his company with dash and vigour. Later, under heavy machine gun fire, he pulled the line together, charged forward and captured 18 prisoners. So that shows you actually Jews involved, as indeed the Jewish Legion was when it was eventually formed, in the attack against the Turks in Palestine, which eventually led to the taking of Jerusalem um, and, of course, the British Mandate, which then led to the State of Israel eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, you mentioned the Great Synagogue, and obviously you've done, there's lots in the, in the book on the Great Synagogue, which really brings it, gives its whole history. Um, and I'm particularly struck by the photo of Chief Rabbi Herx holding a service in the ruins. Yes, well, of course, the Great Synagogue, along with actually the Central as well, so two of the five founding United Synagogues were destroyed by bombing um, in the Second World War. And of course, the Great Synagogue was the particular um, loss. So was the Central, of course, but the Great Synagogue, because it was the cathedral synagogue um, of Anglo Jewry. And so when it, it was bombed, Chief Rabbi Hertz held a 
a ceremony in the ruins of the great synagogue. I hope you can see the photograph of him leading the prayers. Um, but he ends um, with this sort of peroration about the great synagogue will rise again. So he says, uh, unshakable therefore is our confidence that a new day of freedom will dawn for all men. Remember this was in 1941 at the height of the war, that God will comfort Zion and rebuild all her waste places, that victory will crown the righteous cause of Britain and the great synagogue will rise again. I, Almain. Well, victory did uh, crown the cause of Britain, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be here and the United Synagogue wouldn't be here, but the great synagogue didn't rise again. Um, because it was in the wrong place. It was in the east of London and there were no Jews there. So the, the United Synagogue basically took the, took the money for the war damage um, and used it to open Marble Arch Synagogue in the centre of London. So the Great Synagogue unfortunately didn't rise again. And one of the things I've always been wanting to find out is why they didn't call Marble Arch the Great Synagogue and link what it. Do you think? Those. What do you think? That I don't know, because the new synagogue was actually moved from its site close to the Hambra and the Great to Stamford Hill in 1915, and they called it the new synagogue there. Um, so I've never quite understood why they didn't call it the Great Synagogue, but perhaps somebody viewing this. Could... Actually. The actually... other interesting thing, Miriam, is that when the United Synagogue was founded, the charity commissioners said that if any member of any United Synagogue objected to the scheme, then they would not allow the scheme to go forward. So they had to square off all the members. And several members of the Hambra Synagogue, which was like already on its last legs, objected on the basis that once it was merged into the United Synagogue, it would be closed down. And so the United Synagogue gave an undertaking that the Hambra Synagogue would never be closed. And unfortunately, though, in 1935, they got round this undertaking by merging it into the Great Synagogue. So it was, in inverted commas, closed, but it became part of the Great Synagogue, which in turn got destroyed by bombing. So the end of that new part of the history. So the new synagogue now in Stamford Hill um, would be the oldest United Synagogue. Um, it obviously has moved over to a Hasidic community. Um, and that leaves, I suspect, the new West End probably as the um, oldest one in its original building. Yeah. I like the fact that in the book though, you cover the whole of the history of the Great Synagogue. You know, you start at the beginnings right through to the ends and all the- Yes, all the but I think, I mean, we have on the end papers, the most interesting thing I think in my collection, which is that um, the documents are in the, in the Jewish Museum there's a document from 1679 where Benjamin Levy, the founder of the Anglo-Jewish community, buys the lease on a field, um, which eventually became Alderney Road Cemetery. So I have a deed where the next day he transfers it to the members of the synagogue in Shoemaker's Lane, Duke's Place, which is the first, I think, mention of the, what became the Great Synagogue, where he gives it, having bought it himself, he gives it over to the Great uh, the Great Synagogue, and a very sort of uh, magnanimous gesture because Benjamin Levy had already been given a plot in the Sephardi Cemetery, so eminent was he that they would allow an Ashkenazi to be buried there. So he wasn't really buying it for himself, he was buying it for the benefit of the community. <laughs> very good. Um, so in, an, in your next chapter, you talk about the birth of Israel, and it's really nice to see how there are documents relating to raising awareness of Zionism and raising funds for Israel. And you've got a really unusual mix of cuttings and art and letters to, to yes, well, tell this story. I mean, it was a very, you know, Zionism in England was, you know, not a, an uncontroversial subject. Um, and so in 1917, the president of the Board of Deputies and the chairman of the Anglo-Jewish Association wrote to the Times basically saying, we don't want anything to do with this Zionist business and we are Englishmen of the Jewish persuasion. And Chief Rabbi Hertz, in a very, very um, important intervention, which I'm just looking for um, here, intervened and he wrote a letter to the Times. And remember, he was going against the community leadership in this. So he says, I do not propose to advance any arguments concerned contesting the extraordinary statement on Zionism and Palestine, which you published on Thursday last. But as chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the British Empire, I cannot allow your readers to remain under the misconception that the said statement represents in the least the views held either by Anglo Jewry as a whole or by the juries of overseas, of the overseas dominions. It is indeed grievously painful to me to write this in your influential columns, but I'm impelled to do so in the interests of truth 
and Injustice to the Communities, of which I have the honor and privilege of being the spiritual head. J.H. Hertz, Chief Rabbi. It's interesting to reflect, actually, given that his predecessor was much more lukewarm to Zionism, what would have happened if Hermann Adler was still Chief Rabbi in 1917, whether the Balfour Declaration would ever have been issued when the community leadership was against it and the Chief Rabbi himself was lukewarm. But you had already now a Chief Rabbi who was extremely pro-Zionist, and so you know, it led to the Balfour Declaration, really. It's, also, you know, it's unusual to have a letter in the time to my chief rabbi as well. Yes. Well, I think he felt that he was, uh, Chief Rabbi Hertz was not backward in, in coming forward. I mean, they, they say he never ceased to seek a peaceful solution to a problem when all other possibilities had failed. Yeah. So, you know, he was very willing to, to come out. Um, and then, of course, the United Synagogue went on. Um, and when the, when the State of Israel was declared, um, it, it did immediately produce a um, prayer for the state of Israel. Interestingly, that didn't get incorporated into the Singer's Prayer Book in until 1962. So you find these early Singer's Prayer Books from the 1950s, which have pasted in to the front cover, prayer for the welfare of the state of Israel, which is similar to the prayer that we say today. And it says 5th of May, 1948. So they printed it very quickly, but they didn't amend the Singer's Prayer Book until 1962. So you've got the, you get these little leaflets, which are often found stuck into to singers' prayer books to allow people to follow the prayer when the rabbi was saying the prayer. Yeah, and you've got that first prayer for the State of Israel and the order of service. Yes, then, well, the order of service, interestingly, as far as I understand, there was no official United Synagogue order of service to celebrate the, um, in the independence of the State of Israel. What there was, was a service held by the Mizrahi, the religious Zionists, in Hendon Synagogue, which of course is a united synagogue. Whether that reflected some residual feelings about the state or whether it was just happened to be the way it worked out, I don't know. Yeah, it's certainly, it's quite an emotional thing to look at anyway with the, with the writing on it. It's beautiful, really. Yes. Um, and then you've got the, um, the letter from Chaim Weitzman. Yes. So Weitzman is what he is doing there is basically he writes to Chief Rabbi Hertz um, in 1930 when there was, I was trying to find it, um, when there was a um, controversy about the Kotel, about the Wailing Wall, where the British were not allowing access to people to come to the Kotel. Um, on Yom Kippur, they wouldn't allow the chauffeur to be blown for fear it would upset the Arabs. Um, so Chaim Weitzman writes to uh, Hertz. Um, that I'm very grateful to you for communicating to me the letter from the Grand Rabbi Israel Levy, that's the Chief Rabbi of France. We are, of course, most anxious to have the unanimous support of our religious leaders, and we shall take the greatest care to have their views fully put before the Commission. Um, didn't do much good with the Commission, but in the end, of course, that was all solved by the State of Israel, where we now have unrestricted access to the exactly. Yes. And then moving on to sort of other activities... One of my favourite items in your collection is the uh, set of crockery you got from the Cunard liner. Yes. I don't yes, know how such an item survived so many journeys. Well, it's interesting. I mean, and I've got, I uh, just have it with me here just to show. I mean, I think it can come on the screen, but we have oh, here a sort of cup and saucer um, from the Cunard liner. These would be exactly the same as the ones that the non-Jewish customers were having, except if I turn it round, you may be able to see it says milk, kosher and then milchik um, underneath and the same on the saucer it's got that so in fact these survived rather better than the non-jewish ones because the non-jewish ones were tremendously used um, by the people on the liners whereas the kosher ones were much less used and in fact i was told that collectors of Cunar china who have no interest in, in kosher issues actually like to get the kosher ones because they think that they're in better um, condition than the ordinary ones. So, so they did survive. Often you find people have clearly pocketed something. So they've gone away with a knife because the knives and forks also had kosher on them. So they put a sort of knife and a fork and a menu in their pocket um, as a souvenir. So it's, it's an interesting thing because before the war, it was under the supervision of the London Bet Din. Um, and a Reverend Gordon of Southampton was in charge of sort of supervising it. So um, if I can see where I've got it, I've got here um, a menu from the, from the Cunard liner um, from the 19, 
30s, and it says Kashrut under the direct supervision of the London Jewish Ecclesiastical Authorities, headed by the very Reverend Dr. J. H. Hertz, Chief Rabbi of the British Empire, supervising representative of Southampton, the Reverend M. L. Gordon. And we actually have um, also, hopefully that can appear on the screen, a, um, a picture of Reverend Gordon inspecting the kosher kitchen. Um, after the war, this supervision ceased. I don't know why. Um, and the Cunard liners continued to claim that they were kosher, but they didn't have any supervision. And there's a great story of a um, rabbi who comes on board the Cunard liner to sail from America to London, and he meets the Shoma who's on the board, and he says to the Shoma, can one eat the food here? And the Shoma says no. So he says, so why are you here? He said, why, why have we got a Shoma if you can't eat the food? He says, I'm here to tell people like you not to eat here. So funny. I love that. So, so after the war, it was a bit of a deterioration. But before the war, it was really taken seriously. And it was, you know, a key feature in the, in the competition between the different transatlantic aligners who provided the best Jewish facilities, because people didn't fly in those days, there were very few flights. And so they, they went on the liners and they wanted a shawl. So the Queen Mary had a shawl, they wanted kosher food, so kosher food was provided um, and so on. So it was a fascinating, and the London Bet Din played its uh, key role in, in dealing. Yeah, uh, and the, the menu doesn't seem that different to how many might be today. Well, the only difference in the menu is, is, which would be for the non-Jewish passengers as well, is the huge amount of food that you get. Um, so this one, it happens to be a farewell dinner. Um, but you started with mixtures of grapefruit, sardines, salted cucumbers, sort of mixed hors d'oeuvres. Then you had fresh haddock boiled salmon. Then you had yellow split pea soup. Then you had eggs to order. Then you had corn on the cob and vegetables. Then you had salads and so on and you finished with bananas and cream and French pastry. Um, and you would have had obviously a meat meal um, in the evening as well. So that's so it would have been a milk meal and a meat meal, um, so twice a day. So they certainly, like the kosher hotels, they knew that they had to provide um, plenty of food on board. for the. For plenty the of good food. Do you, how many people, Jewish people do you think traveled at that time? I don't know. I think there were enough probably on many, many of the things for you know, there to be a couple of tables. I have seen things. I mean, I have in my collection the, um, the very large siddha, uh, sort of siddha for the omad, um, which was used on the, one of the Cunard liners, like a huge book that was used to lead the davening. And it has many, many signatures in it of people who've signed it, including um, a number who signed at the memorial service held on the liner, for President Kennedy after his assassination. Mm -hmm. So there are about 30 or 40 who indicate that they've signed on the day of the assassination or the day after when the service was held. So uh, there, there must have been quite a lot, I think is the answer to that. Amazing, interesting. And there were interesting class distinctions. So this cup that I've held up before is, yeah. a, is a, club, cup, a cup from the tourist class. If you were in first class, you would have exactly the same cup but you would have a gold band around it. So, and I've got one with a gold band as well. Um, but so you got, there were subtle class distinctions, even in what China you served on the line. I definitely want one with a gold band. <laughs> definitely. Um, and then, you know, in, in the same vein of unusual things, the um, letter, the, the manuscript from Moses Angel about the curriculum. I mean, the yes. education is still such an important part of the United Synagogue. And on that, on that manuscript, you say that he changed the curriculum and there's, it's listed lots of chumash learning and ciphering. Yes. So this is, the, this is this, Moses Angel was headmaster of the Jews Free School for over 50 years um, yeah. in the 19th century. And so when, when he started out on his, um, his headmastering, he produced this book. Um, it's dated Jews Free School, June 1847. Um, which is when he started, he carried on into at the end of the 19th century. Um, and so he's got a whole plan here of the curriculum. Um, but as I was just glancing through it, I saw something um, which is very quirky, which isn't in, uh, on the page that we illustrate in the book. It says, the warming of the school is an important consideration. The plan most generally adopted in public schools is that of Arnott's stove. It is therefore recommended that three Arnott's stoved 
fluted circular stoves like that in the infant school be procured? And then he describes where these stoves should actually be placed. So the headmaster is not only worrying about you know, what the pupils will be taught, he's worrying about the heating of the school and the stoves should be in such and such a places as well. So a remarkable man who really created um, you know, the basis for what we have today in the Jews for experience. Yes, yeah, so he's worried about their emotional and physical Absolutely. well-being too. It's really good to hear. Yes. Um, okay, so then we go on to another chapter where you talk about, you cover chief rabbis. And of course, the first the founding chief rabbi was Nathan Marcus Adler. Yes. You have, you have his application for the post for chief yes. rabbi? So I have two of the documents that he submitted um, to the um, chief rabbinate for the elections. So this was the first election of a chief rabbi. Previously, the chief rabbis were basically made rabbi of the great synagogue, and then they became chief rabbi because it was the most famous shul. Um, this was an election carried out across the whole country, um, all the little communities, all the London shuls. The great synagogue, of course, had a huge number of votes, so it was all weighted. If you got the great and the new and the hambra on your side, it didn't actually really matter what Plymouth said about you, um, but that was um, the way it worked. So he submitted various documents, and I have um, one from a rabbi in Germany testing in German, to Nathan Adler having smicha, and another one um, which testifies to his Hebrew competency. And they're actually both listed in a list that was published at the time of the documents submitted um, by, the, uh, by the chief rabbi, potential chief rabbis. Interestingly, that Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, who later went on to lead the Frankfurt community and basically found um, modern orthodoxy, was a candidate. He was at one time going to be a compromise candidate with, so that the supporters of Adler and another candidate would coalesce around him. That didn't happen, um, and he only got two votes. Um, and so he went on to much greater things um, in Germany and Frankfurt than he had in, would have had in England, I think. Yeah. Um, and then it was interesting about the smichas because um, Nathan Adler was a rabbi, obviously he had smicha, and he trained his son Herman Adler from a very early age um, and eventually sent him off to Prague to get smicha um, from various rabbis in Prague. And I have those smichas of Herman Adler um, as well. And you might think, well, there's nothing remarkable about that, except that um, in those days, there was only supposed to be one rabbi with smicha, and that was the chief rabbi. None of the other ministers, they were supposed to be reverent gentlemen rather than rabbis. And yet Nathan Adler sent Herman Adler to Prague at a, as a young boy in his early 20s to get smicha because he was obviously training him, as happened, to succeed him. And I also have the, the um, smichas of Rabbi Herman Gollens, or as he, as he referred to himself, Rabbi Professor Dr. Sir Herman Gollens, the minister of Bayswater, who also got smicha, but he was not allowed by the chief rabbi to call himself rabbi, even though he had smicha, and he used to go to Leeds every Shavuos, where they would call him up as Moreno Harav, which they wouldn't do in his own shul. So there were all these sorts of uh, difficulties, but clearly uh, both Nathan, I think Nathan Adler intended to establish a dynasty with his son, Herman Adler, whose own son in turn, unfortunately died before him. So he was a minister, Alfred Adler, but he died before they could decide whether he should become chief rabbi after his father. And you have the, the Vanity Fair prints of both yes. of them. Yes. No, only of, only of Herman Adler. Only of um, Herman Adler. But I also have the, um, the Bermitzvah Drosha of Herman Adler, which he spoke. Um, so this is a notebook of his in which he's written as a 13-year-old as a boy, his Bermitzvah Drosha in Hebrew and in English. Um, it goes on and on and on um, for a very large number of pages, as one would expect, um, in beautiful handwriting with a few... Um, amendments, um, and he ends um, with, um, let the ship of my existence toss vehemently and the hands grow faint. The Lord who delivered the pious from the stormy seas, to him I entrust my future, my life, my salvation, here and in eternity. So at that 15. is a future. That's a future chief rabbi writing at the age of 13 in his manuscript, and this is the manuscript notebook. Um, in which he wrote, he wrote that. That's quite an item to have. And then, um, of course, you've, we've covered most of the chief rabbis. I don't think we mentioned the, the 
Brody item, yes. which I really like to talk about, where he talks about beer that he'd left for his... Well, Chief, Chief Rabbi Brody, of course, was the sort of quintessential English candidate for the Chief Rabbinate um, against various other candidates who were seen as less English or less loyal. Um, and so he had been the senior Jewish chaplain. Um, and I have a photograph of him in Cairo, um, with, uh, of course, Brody was previously in Australia, so he's in this picture with Reverend Goldman, the Australian Jewish chaplain, um, and there's a sort of little scrap of paper here, um, which you can see is just like a little scrap um, that he's scribbled on, and it says, Dear Goldman, sorry to have missed you. Have left um, a case of tinned beer and cigarettes for your Jewish men. Good luck, I, Brody. That's beautiful, really. <laughs> But I have to say, you have to contrast that. One of the other candidates for the chief rabbi, Rabbi Louis Rabinowitz, um, was also a chaplain. And when he left London, Cripplewood Shul in the 1930s to go to South Africa, Chief Rabbi Hertz said at the leaving party, we have no doubt you will return to great things. So he saw him as his successor. So why Brody and not Rabinowitz? Because in 1947, at the height of the sort of anti-British feeling um, of Jews in Palestine, Rabinowitz went to a meeting of Cheirut of the revisionists, which he was, wearing his medals, stood at the front of the hall and spoke and said, we who fought for Britain are ashamed of Britain and I will never wear these medals again, and tore off the medals and threw them on the floor. Um, so that prevented him being chief rabbi because he threw the king's head on the floor. So Brody was chosen because he was a sort of good chap and whatever. Um, I do know that, in fact, Rabinowitz had arranged for somebody to pick up the medals um, yeah. and make sure that they were returned to him. So they eventually did come back to his family and eventually the family sold them when I was able to acquire them. Wow. Um, so that's, we've mentioned most, pre most of the previous chief rabbis, except, of course, for Lord Sachs. Um, yes, and, and Lord Jacobowitz. So um, I do, obviously, Lord Sachs, uh, Zachary Lirocha, obviously, I'm, as a member or an ex-member of Dunstan Road Shawl, I remember him as a young um, rabbi. I have a photograph of him as an extremely young-looking rabbi um, at his inauguration in Dunstan Road, the order of service um, for that. And then, in fact, only 13 years later, when he became chief rabbi, again, the order of service inscribed by him, but also a photograph of him with Lord Jacobowitz, so linking um, him with his predecessor. And of course, that is quite a modern thing because up until Chief Rabbi Hertz, all Chief Rabbis died in office. So when Lord Jacobowitz actually spoke at the, at the Leviah of Sir Israel Brody, he said, this is the first time that a Chief Rabbi has eulogized his predecessor um, because normally the predecessor had died and then they started an election process. So on a happier note, Lord Jacobowitz was also able to induct his successor, um, Lord Sachs, as well as um, conducting the Leviah for his predecessor, uh, Rabbi Brody. Yeah, and also that, that photograph is beautiful with the stained glass coming through behind it, and it's yes. very yes. united yes. single, beautiful. Yes, so that's on there. I think that's in St. John's Wood on there, on the inauguration. Yeah. Um, anyway, so David, is there anything else you want to bring up that we haven't covered? Because I think sadly our time's coming to an end. Only that I think it would be very difficult to write this sort of book around almost any other communal organization because the United Synagogue is so embedded um, in the 150 year history of the community that, you know, as we said at the beginning, it wasn't a matter of scraping around to try and find enough orders of service. It was a matter of trying to cut down the material available so that it was you know, the, the right amount that could be fitted into the book. So it shows, I think, in a way that, you know, an ordinary volume about the United Synagogue perhaps can do but this can do it in a much more visual and pictorial way absolutely it's a wonderful book to delve into or to flick through and it's it's just really beautiful as well and with lots of new insights that we've never seen before can i just thank you so much for showcasing your collection and your contribution you. and to the contribution to the understanding of our jewish history and heritage it's really really impressive thank you very much thank you well it's been a great great pleasure for me to do it and to work with the united synagogue and you to to deliver it